Thank you so much, Nelly. And I just can't um, say enough about how wonderful this term has been. Um, my students in the seminar, the audiences um, that have come, um, even on this day of all days, um, uh, when you all of you had some place um, uh, better, more spooky, more amusing, um, I'm sure, to be. Um, so it really has been, a, it's been a, it's been a great time for me. I'm much looking forward to the remainder of my time here. Please do come to the Q&A. We'll be distributing uh, slide sets um, uh, of the entire uh, slides uh, from all of the lectures, um, as well as all of the handouts. So if there's something that you just happen to vaguely remember from one of the previous lectures, but you're not really quite sure how it really went, and you don't want to go through the long um, YouTube series, which you don't, um, uh, uh, the, at least the slide sets will be available to, uh, uh, to flip through. So thank you once again. Um, and thank you, all of you, for being here tonight. So uh, this is um, uh, the wrap up. Um, uh, those of you who have been here before know what to expect um, for the first slide. Um, uh, so here it is yet again. No, <laughs> we're not gonna, okay, that's it uh, for all of that stuff. Um, uh, Socrates um, offers a succinct statement of a folk theory of instrumental rationality. Um, I think that all persons choose out of what is available to them, what they think is most advantageous to themselves, and they do this. So the idea here is this is a statement of uh, what I'm calling a folk theory of instrumental rationality, that is a rational self-interested individual is one who chooses among various options on the basis of well-organized preferences over outcomes, coherent beliefs about the world, and then whose actions aim at the most desirable available outcome among that set. So far, these are the five lectures I've given so far. Um, the folk theory as a premise and a challenge for Greek intellectuals, sophists and Socratics alike. The question then of how self-interested persons are able to cooperate in a way that allows for the emergence of a rational social order, a sustainable social order, leads quickly to the question of who rules, who is ruled over according to uh, what premises, uh, and the origins of monarchy and also of tyranny. Must we have tyranny, or can a democracy also be a rational form for a state? Uh, raises questions of collective action um, and demands certain kinds of institutional innovations. Is there such thing as a rational interstate order, even if we assume it is possible to have rational states of both the tyrannical and the democratic sort? Um, uh, uh, what sorts of domination? resistance uh, are rational, what are the limits of rationality um, uh, as ex expected advantage maximization and what kind of challenges does that give any kind of statesman um, seeking to uh, make choices um, uh, in uh, a world in which choices are highly salient. Okay, that's, that's where we've been. So today, um, what we think about is rational economy, or at least question mark, uh, rational economy, uh, questions of production and exchange, this is meant to close the loop, meant to bring us back to the question of the individual uh, and individual behavior in a world, at least a quasi-rational world, of more or less rational states um, in which uh, the folk theory is known and indeed has been generalized as a basis for choice and action uh, across a population or a big part of the population. So the premise here is that the economic activity of a lot of ordinary classical Greeks does in fact manifest and reproduces the normative rationality that was formalized by the sophists, Thrasymachus and differently by Protagoras, and also by uh, Plato's Glaucon in the Republic. So this rational behavior then, once again, this is the premise, drives a growing Greek economy. It is one of the features that allows for the growth of the population, so you have more people, and also the growth of um, uh, consumption, the higher per capita consumption. 
the hypothesis of this lecture is going to be that Socratic philosophers, Plato, Xenophon, Aristotle, recognized all of that. Um, they saw it as a moral problem, and they sought a solution. Okay. So we have to acknowledge a happy anniversary today, uh, today, this year anyway. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, the um, 70th anniversary um, of the uh, Sather lectures um, offered by E.R. Dodds, the Greeks and the Irrational, um, as I began this lecture series uh, announcing that was a revolution in classical studies, and it's really been a sustained revolution. Check it out on Amazon.com. Um, still selling pretty well, um, and four and a half stars. I mean, doesn't get much better than that, right? Um, if it was five stars, you'd be suspicious. Um, <laughs> what was the first of the chapters um, in this book? And I'm assuming, although can't find the evidence. I'm assuming this is the title of the first lecture. Um, uh, Am Agamemnon's Apology. Okay, And uh, those of you who are thinking about intertextuality um, will notice that there is a very self-conscious intertextuality. Um, that which was first will now be last. Um, uh, and I'll be talking about um, uh, Agamemnon's cluelessness. Um, uh, so how does Dodds get into this business about um, uh, uh, the apology. Well, as Dodds notes in book 19, this is in his first chapter, Agamemnon comes to Achilles' tent seeking a bargain to make a deal, uh, bringing Achilles back onto the battlefield. Achilles was on strike. I'm using some of the language that we developed along the way. This isn't Dodds' language, but I think it captures pretty well what's going on. Because, as everyone knows, Agamemnon had seized Achilles' prize captive, Briseis. And so, to make amends, Agamemnon returns Briseis along with a whole bunch of other treasure. He offers an apology in the contemporary English sense. He expresses regret for Dodd's chapter title. But as Dodds was well aware, the apology is all also an apologia. That is, it's an exculpatory self-defense. Agamemnon claims, and it's Dodd's central point, um, Achilles agrees that Agamemnon's choice was motivated not by his own desires, but by Ate, uh, divine madness. Indeed, the very possibility of having own desires is what brought Dodds is bringing into question. So as I mentioned once again in the first lecture, at the very moment that Dodds was delivering his lectures on uh, the Greeks and the irrational, there was a concomitant revolution uh, under the rubrics of rational choice, game theory, um, uh, decision theory, a revolution in the analysis of practical reason. And John von Neumann was at the very center of this. Von Neumann, one of the great mathematicians of the 20th century, um, uh, a, uh, a clearly a, a mathematical genius, um, who, among other things, um, uh, invented uh, or co-invented um, uh, the theory of games. So question once again that I asked last time, and I promised you we'd come back to. Um, uh, could uh, von Neumann and Dodds actually have met, and could they have agreed on anything, that they could have had anything that they might have um, uh, seen eye to eye on? I suggested last time the answer is yes, um, and that where they could have met um, was in Berkeley in 1949, and that it's quite possible to think about them having uh, things that they would agree upon or see eye to eye on. Indeed, I suggested briefly that it would be fun to speculate about them collaborating on a project, a project likes the Greeks and the rational. Um, now, how's that about um, uh, anxiety of influence, right? I was going to have a little cartoon image of Harold Bloom um, popping up at this point, but he recently died, and I thought that would be inappropriate. Um, uh, so uh, anyway, there you, there you have it, uh, uh, the counterfactual history. Um, all right, let's think about what goes into this apology. Um, uh, this is well known to everyone in the room, but I'll run through it very quickly. In the book one of the Iliad, Chryses, priest of Apollo, enters the 
a key in camp, offers Agamemnon a rich ransom for the return of his daughter. Um, uh, and the offer is presented as a fair one. Um, the Achaean army, here seemingly acting as a coherent articulate collective, urges Agamemnon to accept the offer. So there's an implicit counterfactual here, I think. Um, uh, Plato doesn't, or uh, uh, Homer doesn't give it to us as a, as a counterfactual, um, uh, but I think it's at least implicit that Agamemnon might have recognized that the army was right. Um, given back the girl, taken the ransom, no epic. Um, uh, but of course, um, that's not what happened. Uh, Agamemnon chooses to keep uh, Chryseis. Um, he sends off crises with threats and insults. The eventual outcome is Zeus's plan. Uh, that is, many deaths and much misery. Another happy anniversary. <laughs> that's not a retouched picture. OK, um, uh, 1969 to 70, Hugh Lloyd-Jones explores the justice of Zeus, exactly um, uh, uh, the problem of uh, uh, Zeus's plan and then how later Greeks um, uh, thought differently about, about Zeus. OK, in book one, it's important to note that Zeus's plan was not yet operative. Um, uh, it has an immediate sequence of events then follows um, after Chryses has been sent off from the camp with insults. Um, uh, Chryses prays to Apollo, reminding the god of his worthy sacrifices, etc. Apollo reciprocates. Yes, worthy sacrifices. I'll um, uh, reciprocate, sending a plague upon the Achaean camp. The source of the plague is discovered after Achilles promises to protect the seer Kalkas from Agamemnon's wrath. Um, and we get the short-term outcome. Agamemnon sends Chryseis back to her father along with a great deal of booty in order to save the army from this ongoing plague. OK, so Agamemnon after that is really out of pocket. Right? He has lost his prize captive. He's sent off all of this um, extra booty. Uh, and he's really down on prestige. He's had to show that he was, he was, had, he was wrong. Um, rather than accepting this situation, of course, he employs threat of force, numerous armed men, to take Briseis, Achilles' prize captive, as his own. Achilles, famously angry, um, leaves the field of battle, goes to his mother Thetis, asking for help. Thetis calls in a favor with Zeus. Zeus's plan then becomes operational. That's when Zeus's plan um, uh, goes into, 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 uh, uh, into focus. Um, the Achaeans then start losing the war. Agamemnon ultimately has to apologize, begs Achilles to return, gives Briseis back rich gifts, blames his conduct on Ate, okay, 1 to 19. Now comes the imaginary conversation. Okay, underline this. This is, not, this is not fake news. This is an imagined conversation. It didn't happen, or at least if it did, it would be pure serendipity. So what we do know is that von Neumann did spend time in California. Um, uh, he consulted uh, at Lawrence Livermore. He at least considered late in his life uh, taking a UC job. Uh, von Neumann had a classical education um, uh, in, as a, uh, a Hungarian raised um, in the gymnasium uh, system. Um, he was a great reader, a famous reader of Greek history, and he could recite large um, swaths of poetry from memory. Dodds, for his part, was deeply interested in social science. He really underlines this in the preface um, uh, to um, uh, the Greeks and the Irrational, talks about the social scientists that were there, along with, of course, the classicists uh, in the audience for his say their lecturers. OK, so imagine conversation. Von Neumann attempts, attends Dodds for a say their lecture on Agamemnon's apology. He finds the argument for irrationality interesting, but incomplete, and suggests that Dodds has overlooked a passage in Iliad Book One. You see why it's important that he can quote um, poetry from, from uh, memory, um, that might point to an alternative explanation for Agamemnon's choice. So this is Iliad One, 
343 to 344, handout number one, critically describing Agamemnon's choice of seizing Briseis, Achilles says, truly he rages with baneful mind and knows not at all to look both backwards and forwards in time, hama proso kai o piso, so that his Achaeans might wage war in safety beside their ships. So, here is the imagined conversation that goes on. Um, uh, having brought up this passage, uh, uh, von Neumann um, suggests that Dodds think about the goings on in the um, Crises Agamemnon situation as a game. Um, uh, Dodds here is still puzzled, but he's going to get it as we go along. Um, so, uh, we begin with the Crises story. Um, and then what von Neumann suggests is that we do just what we've been doing along the way with these lectures, um, work up the tree to outcome A. So Agamemnon then is going to choose uh, whether to um, uh, keep Chryseis or um, uh, send her back to her father. Um, and then there'll be various payoffs for him. He'll have a payoff of two if he does that. Um, then Chryseis um, is going to uh, decide whether to seek the help of a god or uh, not seek the help of the god. If he doesn't, he's going to have a nasty payoff. Um, uh, uh, then there's going to be the gods, which in this case are going to um, uh, simply be kind of a, uh, a probability function. Um, uh, so with uh, a probability uh, P, um, some between one and a number between one and zero, the gods uh, will um, uh, reciprocate uh, uh, with uh, one minus uh, a p, then some the opposite of that of that uh, function. Um, uh, the gods will not reciprocate, um, and then uh, if they do reciprocate, then Agamemnon's going to be in the condition um, of either not uh, trying to give the girl back, in which case he loses the war because his army is completely destroyed, which is a really lousy payoff for him, um, uh, or uh, he gives her back um, up here. This, we know this is what actually uh, happens. Okay, so we were up the game tree, right? And so Dodd's saying, oh, I get it, oh, piso, right? Um, uh, and then, um, uh, now we're going to move back down the game tree, proso. Um, uh, and so we just have to compare the payoffs that Agamemnon has um, uh, here and here in his last uh, choice. And his uh, payoff um, here is worse than his payoff here, so that one goes away. And then we have to think about this God's probability, and you have to think, well, what's the probability that, uh, uh, in this case, Apollo is not going to reciprocate? I think, you know, probably from what we know about about Homeric gods, eh, Apollo's probably going to reciprocate. That's probably a pretty good guess. Um, uh, and uh, uh, working our way back on down, um, uh, a crisis um, has to then decide whether to ask the gods whether to do this or not. Um, it gets a crummy payoff um, uh, if he doesn't. Um, uh, and then since we've knocked these out, he gets a good payoff up here. So he'll um, uh, choose to, uh, in fact, uh, seek the gods' help. And then we get down to Agamemnon, uh, who ultimately has to make um, his choice. Okay, so now von Neumann is going to say, you see that Agamemnon's made a mistake, um, uh, at least if he's estimated um, uh, this god uh, function um, uh, anywhere like correctly. And see, now um, Dodds gets it because one um, is less than two, Agamemnon's payoff of one and two, so therefore there's been um, uh, an error. Uh, and so uh, then you know, Nyman says, well, now how would we account for that? Uh, uh, Daz immediately, ah, ate, oh, I see. But it could be a problem with estimating the probabilities. Um, if we could assume he is perfectly rational. He just uh, uh, didn't get probabilities uh, uh, very well. Um, and now von Neumann is going to say, right, think about the Achilles story. Um, uh, and uh, Dodds, okay, yeah, I, 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 we will, and here it goes, and here's the way it is, um, uh, and now we've got Achilles instead of Crises, um, and a different uh, a god, uh, and um, Dodds notices just what you have all noticed, it's exactly the same game. Uh, at which point uh, von Neumann can point out, yes, that's why we do this kind of formalization in game theory. 
Um, because obviously you can explain that in words, but when you graph it, it becomes really obvious. Um, uh, and so the whole point um, uh, of this kind of formalization is it allows us to compare situations, see what's similar or different about them. We can do it um, graphically like this, we can do it mathematically, um, but that is one of the big payoffs um, uh, about game theory. You can see what is regular and what is irregular, what is the same and what is different. Um, uh, and so uh, von Neumann now, looking forward uh, uh, to the future, says, yes, Agamemnon is as Michael Chue will eventually, long um, after von Neumann's death, um, uh, point at uh, clueless. Um, he's just not good at game, uh, uh, games. Um, uh, and uh, yes, I see, says, uh, says Dodds. But Dodds um, uh, raises the point that the cluelessness could still arise from Ate, and at least my von Neumann says, yes, that's he's not going to fight it. He's saying there's perfectly plausible to say that there are motivations um, uh, that uh, lead to um, uh, seemingly irrational behavior. Uh, so Achilles' account of, Ag of Agamemnon's choice does not, I would suggest, directly contradict the Book 19 description of motivation to Ate. After all, Achilles agreed with um, Agamemnon's uh, claim that he was driven by Ate. But it does implicitly contrast Agamemnon's behavior to that of a competent decision maker faced with options in a high stakes situation. Uh, and uh, Hama Proso Kai O Piso is, of course, a Homeric formula um, uh, occurring three times by my count, and I may have missed one, um, uh, in the uh, uh, Iliad and Odyssey. Um, the examples are on your handout. You can look, work them through um, uh, if you like uh, uh, at leisure. Um, but the point here, I think, is that this phrase does never, never refers to an oracular or mantic capacity to see into the future. That's not what it's about. Um, the agents who are said to have this capacity are invariably older men in a position of having to assess a really high stakes situation. They formulate a judgment and offer advice to others um, about the best, although not the most obvious or more, most popular course of action. That advice may be ignored, um, but clearly in the context, it should have been followed. The world would go better had their advice um, uh, been followed. So without pressing this too far, and obviously I, it would be possible to press it too far, and we don't want to, I think we can think of this Hama Proso Kaio Piso formula as an emic Homeric account of rationality. There is a conception of a possible kind of rationality, a capacity to com connect preferences over outcomes with coherent beliefs, estimation of probability, the likely behavior of other players in the game. The key point here is this capacity seems in Homer to be pretty rare and often ineffective. Um, so Achilles, no less than Agamemnon, seems pretty clueless um, in choosing courses of action that lead to outcomes that are bad for himself and that one might think are predictably um, going to end up being bad for himself. Uh, and the rational advice of wise elders is frequently ignored. So where are we in this world? Well, I think arguably we're in the world that Moses Finley famously suggested in 1954 should be called the world of Odysseus. Um, so like Dodds, Finlay employed anthropology to illuminate Greek antiquity. His, among his key arguments in this terribly important book um, was that exchange in Homeric early Greek society was not based on impersonal rational market behavior. It's not that kind of exchange, property rights contracts, prices set by supply and demand, and so on. Rather, Finley followed Marcel Mauss, the famous work um, originally, uh, The Gift, originally um, in 1925, um, arguing that Homeric exchange was based on personal relationships, on reciprocity, giving and receiving of gifts. Of course, also, although this is less emphasized uh, by Finlay, also violence. Um, Crusades, Brisses, the loot in Agamemnon's and Achilles' tent, all of this was taken in raids. 
Homer's Achaeans were, in the language that we discussed in the last lecture, roving bandits. So jumping out of Homer in forward to Thucydides um, uh, and recapitulating a point made uh, last time, uh, according to Thucydides, in early times, all the Greeks lived in both unsettled and penurious conditions, and they did so because of the inability of their communities to defend themselves against roving bandits, um, and the motive of the bandits, these piratical strongmen, was um, in uh, uh, personal gain and building coalitions um, of followers through sharing the loot. This is exactly, of course, what's happening in the, in the Iliad. Um, uh, so for Thucydides, the contrast was between this early Greek world um, of roving bandits and his own world, the time at the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War. Um, and a key theme for Thucydides is the dramatic growth of methods of social organization, of kinds of state power, of the overall wealth of the Greek world, concentrated especially, but certainly not uniquely, um, in Athens since Homer's time. Um, makes a big point of things were small and boresome in Homer's time, things are big and well organized in my time. And that's why the Peloponnesian War is such a great war compared to the Trojan War, says Thucydides very explicitly. Um, uh, I would say Thucydides was right. The world of Pericles was indeed much more prosperous than the world of Odysseus. And as we now know, I think, um, the world of Plato and Aristotle continued that prosperous trend. So uh, this is from some of my earlier work. Um, this is on uh, figure three. I think the, the um, handout got a little misstapled. So the um, two things from uh, uh, Dodds and uh, von Neumann got on the last page, and this is on the penultimate page. doesn't really matter. At any rate, um, the point here is that uh, it's possible to do very, using archaeological evidence, very rough estimates of uh, uh, consumption times uh, uh, multiples of subsistence times uh, estimates of total population in millions. Um, and uh, uh, in any event, uh, however accurate you think this is, there's no question that um, the world of Plato and Aristotle was vastly wealthier um, uh, than the world of Homer. Um, I don't think we even need to debate that anymore. Um, uh, the question is, why does that happen? I mean, well, the, that there is growth. Now, why does that happen? We can debate that. Um, uh, so the growth um, uh, is driven, um, uh, at least according to Alain Bresson, um, who I think is right about this, at least in part by market exchange. And there's lots and lots of more work on this. I mean, this has been one of the major um, areas of research um, in classical Greek history over the last 20 years. Um, and I think we're at the point in which um, we're fairly sure that something really substantial has changed. So... Once again, it's not an anniversary. I don't get to do a happy anniversary, or at least it's not a 10-year anniversary. Um, uh, but uh, uh, the say their lectures that Moses Finley gave in 1971-72, published as The Ancient Economy, have been hugely influential. I think we can now say they're wrong. And I say that without any meaning to diss Finley. Without Finley, I couldn't, I wouldn't have had a career. Um, I've based a great deal of my work on some of his insights, so it's not saying there's something um, uh, uh, that we should sort of throw away that whole career, um, but I think he was wrong uh, on this point. So what Finley does in The Ancient Economy, very crudely, is doubles down on the arguments in the world of Odysseus. Um, social status, not capital accumulation, always motivated Greeks and Romans, and therefore there was no economic growth over time or not meaningful economic growth over time in classical antiquity, no meaningful material progress, nothing remotely like economically rational market exchange. So if I'm right that he's wrong, then the question is how to get it wrong. Um, because he's really, really smart. So I would suggest that at least part of the answer is in a very strong form of historicism. So 
Finley's historical method in ancient economy largely ignores archaeology, numismatics, documents. It focuses on specific passages in literary texts, and it makes the assumption that texts, at least the ones that are being focused on, are more or less direct reflections of the ideology, the social attitudes of their authors, elite authors. And these elite attitudes, according to the argument, then drive social practice, and indeed drive social practice all the way down, um, so that um, it's a top-down story um, about um, uh, ideological diffusion. And the big payoff here is the chapter on um, uh, the Feast of Tromalchio. Okay, so I'm going to suggest an alternative, and it's not a rejection of historicism, it's a form of critical historicism. So the method is this, don't read texts, at least the ones we're interested in here, as a direct reflection of social attitudes all the way down. Instead, read these philosophical texts, at any rate, as critical, as philosophical commentary on social practices. So the hypothesis then is that the discussions of economic behavior, notably market rationality, expressed in Socratic texts do not reflect the typical attitudes or behaviors of most Greeks, nor are they merely exemplars of standard elite aristocratic sensibilities. Rather, they're sharply, deeply critical of prevailing attitudes and practices, and their criticism reveals those practices by its critical response to them. Uh, basically, I want to say they knew a lot about what was going on, and they thought there was reason um, uh, to criticize it. So here's my a bit of the argument. We'll just sort of work through a bit of a text. You were wondering, gee, where's poor old Plato in the Republic? Uh, uh, aren't we going to have that? We've had him each week. Here he comes. Um, and we're going all the way back to the very beginning of book one, or the, almost the very beginning, um, the discussion between Socrates and Cephalus, the owner of the house that Socrates uh, ends up in um, at the beginning of the um, uh, dialogue. So the question is, is Cephalus' character or his circumstances, what allows him to claim that wealth is merely a useful instrument that enables an equitable person, like himself, to be honest in all matters. Cephalus is a medic. Um, he's clearly um, uh, depicted as wealthy. And Socrates wants to know, did Cephalus mostly inherit his wealth or make it himself? Ask that explicitly. Cephalus roughly says, some of each. Um, he calls himself middling, mesostis, as a moneymaker, a crematistes. Uh, His grandfather, Cephalus I, was a true expert um, in this moneymaking. Uh, his father was a complete incompetent. Um, uh, uh, describing himself, he says, I am content if I pass on to my heirs not less, but a little more than I myself inherited. So he clearly has made some money. He's inherited some money. It's some of each. So Socrates says, in essence, oh, I see. So your money was inherited. And I think we should be now pausing to say, what? Um, no, he said both. Uh, and now you've just wiped out um, the money-making bit. Socrates immediately goes on to basically underline, oh, why did I let you off the hook there when you actually admitted you made money um, because I, have, I don't like money makers um, or he doesn't like to hang out with money makers anyway. Cephalus appears to Socrates to lack the excessive passion for money, making, for money that is typical um, of those who made it himself. Um, in contrast um, with Cephalus, those who have made money take it seriously as their own creation as well as valuing its use as other people do, the own creation, the um, parallels here that Socrates suggests are poets and, and uh, parents. Um, money makers, um, as opposed to wealth inheritors, are difficult to spend time with because they can praise only wealth. The implication is they're really no good as dialogue partners. So, Cephalus, you really did inherit that money, right? Um, Socrates uh, 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 seems here perhaps to be um, exhibiting just aristocratic contempt for money, work, um, uh, or nouveau riche, but I suggest that there's something else going on. 
Socrates now moves to um, uh, refute Cephalus' description of justice as paying what is owed. And Socrates um, does this by the famous example of um, a man who borrows a knife from another man. Um, the lender then goes mad. Returning the knife under these circumstances is wrong. Um, the lender will hurt himself or, or others. Um, and Cephalus at this point says, I'm going to do some sacrifices. Uh, and he hands on the dialogue to his son, Polemarchus. The dialogue having been passed to Polemarchus, Socrates presses the madman's knife issue. If two, friend, two people are friends and one gives back money deposited with him to the other, when the exchange is going to cause harm, the one returning the money is not giving the other what is owed to him. So Socrates then says, what about justice now? For what need or for producing what would you, Polemarchus, say it was useful in peacetime? Polemarchus, it's useful in connection with business contracts. Right? Remember, he's the son of um, uh, Cephalus. He is the heir of Cephalus. Um, uh, oh, Socrates, by business contracts, do you mean partnerships or, or something else? Polemarchus, oh yes, partnerships. And Socrates points out, by reference specifically to playing a board game, C.F. Leslie Kirk's work, um, uh, that the skilled expert rather than the just man is more valuable partner in any enterprise. Polemarchus then struggles to explain when the just man is ever the more useful partner. Socrates, um, so what then is the occasion for the joint use of silver or gold when the just man is a more useful partner than others? Polemarchus, well, when it's put on deposit and kept safe, Socrates. Socrates now closes the trap. In fact, you mean when we have no use at all for it, but put it by Polemarchus? Oh, yes, exactly. Um, Socrates, so when money is useless, that's when justice is useful in relation to it. Polemarchus, gub, gub, gub. Um, okay, so counterfactual. Let's bring in the ghost, it's Halloween after all, of Cephalus I, um, uh, the great-grandfather of Polemarchus, the expert, um, uh, uh, Crematistes, the guy who um, made uh, a great deal, inherited some money, and multiplied it many times over. Um, Polemarchus is not described even as a moderately expert Crematistes, um, and in fact, I think we have reason to believe that he doesn't want to get involved in that world. Um, uh, but what if we bring in Cephalus? Um, uh, I think the dialogue would never have gotten to the point of gub, gub, gub. Um, uh, because Cephalus certainly didn't multiply his fortune many times over by depositing his money in an inert account with somebody else. His creative, remember that Socratic line, um, uh, the money makers think of it as creative. His creative approach to money making meant that if and when he deposited money with someone else, he expected a return of principal plus interest, tokos, the person to whom the loan was made in order to produce that interest would have to also have put it to work and we're in a world of economic activity. So Socrates is very specifically, and I think explicitly um, and self-consciously foreclose the topic of fair, creative money-making, and this blocks the path of defining justice as epiaikeia, as equity or decency. That is the cardinal virtue that Cephalus II, the guy with whom the dialogue begins, had claimed for himself. He calls himself an epi case. What is an epi case? Well, here we have to cheat a bit, jump forward to um, Aristotle. Uh, and in the Nicomachean Ethics, um, Aristotle says an epi case is he who is by choice and in practice does what is equitable and is not a stickler for the letter of the law, but is content to receive a lesser share, although he has the law on his side. So I think we can say that Epiaikeia corrects errors in the administration of justice arising from the strict application of general rules that by the very nature of generality are unable to attend to particulars. So, Think about Cephalus, this is Cephalus II, the self-proclaimed FBI case, as a member of a commercial community. Um, he interprets his community's understanding of the pay your debts rule 
in light of the relevant particulars. Um, he withholds the borrowed knife from the madman and expects to be praised, not blamed, for having done so. The knife's owner, imaginatively also an FBI case in the same community, would ex ante accept the fairness of receiving a lesser share, Aristotle, in the case of his own subsequent loss of sanity. The payoff here is that Socrates' scorn for money-making and Kephalus' untimely exit from the dialogue shutter a window onto Greek economic rationality. Right? Socrates says, it's the rule. You lend the knife, you have to give it back. It's an absolute rule. The FBI case says, that's silly. It makes no sense of the particulars. Okay. Um, so the conclusion of Socrates and Polemarchus, at a decisive turn, Socrates trots out the familiar analogies of the general who is an expert, and in this case expert not only at defeating the enemy, but stealing the enemy's plans, the doctor who can not only heal but to make um, people uh, ill, uh, and Socrates. So whatever someone is skillful, whenever someone is skillful, a skillful guardian, he will also be a skillful thief, Polemarchus, I suppose so. Socrates, um, if then he, uh, the just person is good at guarding money, he'll also be good at stealing it, Polemarchus, that's the way the argument seems to be heading. Socrates, then it appears the just man is unveiled as some kind of a thief. And you're likely to have learned from Homer. You see why we started with Homer? Um, for I tell you, he's fond of Autolycus, um, uh, Odysseus' maternal grandfather, and says that he excelled all men in thieving and perjury. So if we notice here the Homeric reference that Socrates trots out suggests a, a continuity between this theft-based Homeric economy and classical money-making. And furthermore, we get a foreshadowing of Republic Book Two, the dangerous guardians, right, the Fulakes, who would, if they were not properly educated, seize the property of the defenseless producers, Gyges, the one-time shepherd who steals a kingdom, having murdered the king, the ostensibly just man who, in fact, given the opportunity, is motivated exactly as he is, the unjust man. We all ran through all of that in the first um, uh, lecture. The implication then is the activity of the epi case, crematistes, is rational and bad. And that's basically the payoff that we've been led to. Um, uh, so is it just that, um, given Socrates' disinclination to spend time with money makers, that neither he nor Plato nor anyone in that circle had any interest or any understanding of the economic processes that had actually created the material conditions of the world in which he lived, if you believed anything about that chart I gave you? And the answer is no. Um, the first polis establishes the economic foundation for Callipolis. That's just what it does. Um, uh, and although simple and healthy, the first polis is predicated explicitly on interdependence. Socrates says, they, all humans in communities, each share things with one another. If there is something to share or exchange them, believing that it is better for each of them in this way. The original members of the first polis are a farmer, a house builder, a weaver, shoemaker, or anyone else to deal with our physical needs. Each one of these specializes in a single activity. The subsistence alternative, in which each does everything for himself, the subsistence uh, economy, providing the necessities um, uh, for himself, his family, is rejected as inefficient. Socrates says, says, indeed, as a result of this, that is the specialization of economic function that he's been describing, um, all these things, that is the various necessities of life, grow more plentiful, plio, become better, kalion, and easier, rayon, when one man does one job according to his aptitudes and opportunities and leaves everything else alone. So Adam Smith, trotting out another figure, another ghost here, would surely have agreed with this efficiency principle. Finley denied that efficiency was ever noticed, never, never even noticed, much less practiced. The very pop uh, possibility of a Greek writer grasping Smithian economic principles was rejected by Finley in an essay from 1963. 
Um, this is my um, uh, italics here. Uh, the very few ancient writers who mention division of labor at all do so in a context and from a point of view which are essentially different from Adam Smith's. They were interested in the quality of manufacture, not quantity or efficiency. Indeed, the very notion of efficiency is one of the best examples of a modern concept which, though taken as self-evident, turns out to be missing in such contexts throughout antiquity. So Finley here seemingly assumes that literature, at least the literature he's reading, accurately represents social reality. So the infrequency of literary references to division of labor prove its unimportance. Um, if a conception is missing in literature, the associated practices are assumed to be absent in antiquity. Finley's claim of missing efficiency, I'm just going to assert, is contradicted by the passage we just looked at, um, uh, Republic 370C. Plato's Socrates cites three distinct elements of economic improvement, quantity, quality, and efficiency, and each of these is called out um, uh, and locked together um, uh, in what seems to me an analytically coherent package. If we reject simple representation then as the relationship between text and reality in favor of a critical evaluation, then Socrates' description of the first polis can be used as evidence for his firm grasp on at least some of the basic economic processes that are operative in the classical Greek world and as ep evidence for his critical stance towards those processes. Right? So uh, as he goes on, the first polis develops further specializations. Imports will be essential. No imports without exports. So therefore, you have to attend to the wants of um, uh, people who are going to import the goods that we're going to uh, send to them so we can import their goods. This requires production aimed at external markets and knowledge of preferences of exchange partners. There's going to be a need for merchants and expert sailors to convey these imports and exports, sharing the surplus obviously will be affected through buying and selling, so you'll need an agora, you'll need coinage as a token of exchange value, you'll need full-time retail traders to organize internal trade as well as manual laborers who are um, uh, described as unworthy of full membership in the community, unlike the traders, by the way. It's only the manual laborers who are excluded. Okay, full polis then is, I think, uh, first polis is a lesson in microeconomics um, because it lacks the counterintuitive features of Kallipolis, it is well suited for offering Plato's readers a basic course in economics. This is the system that's going to sustain Kallipolis. It doesn't have any of the stuff about what the guardians are going to have, you no know, private property and so on and so forth. We need to get this foundation set before any of that stuff is brought in. Um, in comparison to a counterfactual, inefficient, impoverished subsistence regime, which Plato explicitly um, suggests, more and better goods are produced, exchanged, and therefore available for consumption, and the principles on which the needs of the residents are met are presented as universals, foundational for any community. The conclusion then is that Plato understood the economic drivers of welfare and growth at the micro-foundation of the preferences and beliefs of interdependent choice-making agents. The Republic, I would suggest, ought to be read um, not as ignorant of economic rationality, but as a critique of it. Um, an economy based on specialization and exchange, according to Plato, risks unconstrained, unregulated, unhealthy growth. But this potential arises from desire-driven preferences added to false beliefs and efficient economic processes devised by rational agents. Normative ideals, the first polis, which is self-regulating because its residents lack desires for reg um, luxury and moderate their other desires. Callipolis, which is regulated by ethically as well as instrumentally rational philosopher kings, is contrasted to descriptive reality. The residents of Greek polis are unregulated, driven by ultimately destructive, unbounded economic rationality, and worse yet, dangerously effective rationality is exacerbated by sophistic teaching and institutionalized in state-level rules and cultural norms, the things we've been talking about. Aristotle gets short shrift in my lecture, as he 
has gotten a short shrift in the Sather lectures generally. As far as I can see, and someone will correct me if I get this wrong, there hasn't been a single Sather lecture with the title Aristotle in the, in the uh, title. There's been lots of Plato's. So here I am just recapitulating Sather history by spending all my time on Plato. But it gives uh, Aristotle a little bit of time. Um, uh, so in the second book uh, of the politics, Aristotle um, suggests that Plato makes a basic category error of conflating of polis and oikos. Um, and, uh, uh, Aristotle um, suggests um, that Plato invites um, a commons tragedy, a commons tragedy of exactly the sort um, that is discussed and potentially answered by um, the terrific work of Eleanor Ostrom, uh, Nobel Prize winner in 2009, who cites this very passage. That which is common to the greatest number of owners receives the least attention. People care most for their private possessions, for what they own in common, uh, less or only insofar as it falls to their own individual share. For in addition to the other reasons, they think less of it on the ground that someone else is thinking about it. Um, and in household management, a large number of slaves sometimes give work service than a smaller number. So it's basically the, the, the tragedy um, uh, of the commons. Aristotle critiques not only Plato on rationality, however, but economic rationality itself. So he joins in with Plato in critique of dangerous economic rationality. In the first book of the politics, Chrismatistike, the expert knowledge of the relationship among production and exchange and consumption, all involving coined money, as he explicitly says, is put into its normatively correct place in a naturalized hierarchy of value. We end up, and a lot of work has to be done to show how we end up, but I won't take your time doing it today, that a critical conclusion, that is, crematistike, is a subordinate part of oikonomia. It is a techne arising only from practical experience, from empyrea. It is not according to nature. Its aims are the possession and increase of wealth, that is, accumulation of money as an end. Here's the problem. Accumulation of that sort is unbounded and unconstrained. Wealth denominated in money has no natural limit, and therefore it exists outside of nature, and it's likely to degrade rather than help um, uh, achieving the true uh, ends, the telos uh, of the polis, as a natural entity. So Krematistiki for Aristotle is a prevalent approach to the management of material goods. It is at least potentially an essential instrument for both the economos, the, as it were, um, holder of private property, and the politikos, who is rightly aiming at eudaimonia. So he, like Plato, he says, you need this. So as Plato suggests in the first polis, you need to know about this. This is a basis, but it all too readily devolves into an end, maximizing a single resource, which is wrongly thought to give access to all other resources because it doesn't give access to moral resources, rather, being, uh, rather than being a means for developing the right kind of ends, for developing virtues. When unbounded, it's a contrary to eudaimonia, the true end of human existence, and so in brief, like Plato, Aristotle shows that he knows enough about this dangerous and vulgar instrument to specify its proper uses while refusing to honor it as a science worthy of detailed treatment. So, summing up, I hope that I've convinced you in this lecture in the course of the last several weeks that by revisiting various ways in which the Greeks thought about, in which they wrote about, in which they acted on the basis of what we can now call practical reason, we can recognize the value of integrating social science with humanistic studies um, and the value for humanists and social science alike. Decision theory, game theory can, I think, be added to the extensive toolbox of classical scholarship, revealing otherwise obscure facets of our texts, which is, I take it, the reason for um, a, a new tool for classical studies. Um, and furthermore, um, exploring ancient non-mathematical analogs of decision and game theory demonstrates, and this is, I think, part of the value for social scientists, um, what can and cannot be done without the math. 
Well, if I have convinced you of that, then five conclusions follow, and these are on the fourth page of your handout, just so you can run through them at your leisure when you like. The first conclusion is that the discovery of practical reason is the formalization of a Greek folk theory of instrumental rationality. So I want to say the sophists did not invent instrumental rationality. There's hints of it, at least in Homer. But they formalized it, taught it to elites in strong, even weaponized forms as a norm and as a skill set, as what it means to be rational and how to go about being rational. Philosophers and historians, among others, sought to better understand and further formalize the elements of the folk theory. So that's what's happening, for example, in book two of Plato's Republic. By the classical period, self-conscious strategic reasoning from preferences and beliefs to choice and action aimed at maximizing expected advantage was widespread at all levels, at the level of the individual, at the level of the state, and at least to some extent at the level of interstate relations. And this was a matter not only for elite individuals, but rather instrumental rationality was manifest in the economic behavior of ordinary Greeks. Second conclusion, theories of rational choice have a very long history. Elements of the folk theory antedate the Sophistic and Socratic formulizations. There was no innocent age of pre-rational Greek thought and practice. So chopping Greek history into pre-Socratic and post-Socratic um, is simply false, at least insofar as this part of it goes. Furthermore, rational choice theory, at least as a philosophical rather than a mathematical formalization of human behavior, is not uniquely a product of unique 20th century conditions, not arising only in a world um, in which nuclear weapons and advanced capitalism are part of the background. There is no innocent age of pre-rational choice theory, Western thought and practice either. The gap, finally, between evaluative and normative theories and behavioral psychological practices has also long been recognized and long been explored. It's already a feature of um, Greek thinking about rationality. Third, the ancient Greeks are less foreign than we might think. Um, and here, I'll just call out um, another happy anniversary. Um, uh, this to uh, Bernard Williams, say their lectures in 1989. His lectures were actually 1988 to 89. I'm cheating a little bit, but I wanted a third anniversary. Um, so uh, I would suggest that if the ancient Greek past is a foreign country, the tagline that we now hear, um, it's a country whose language of rationality, choice, and behavior is quite readily translated into our own. Own. Bernard Williams pointed this out in reference to shame and necessity um, in his great um, uh, Sather lecture book um, by that title. So the fourth conclusion, instrumental rationality was a critical target of philosophical eudaimonism. Practical reason, when formalized as instrumental rationality, threatened to undermine, on the one hand, conventional Greek ethical commitments, but I think for the philosophers, more importantly, it threatened to impede the development of higher, specifically philosophical forms of ethical reasoning. So it impedes the development of the rational choice of the right preferences, the preferences for the good um, or the fine. It impedes the development of true beliefs, whether these are metaphysical or based on observations of nature. It impedes then the consistent choice of virtuous actions, over the um, vicious alternatives. Um, it impedes consistently aiming at the highest human ends. And therefore, one of the primary purposes of eudaimonistic philosophy was demonstrating what was wrong with instrumental rationality. But, fifth conclusion, finally, instrumental rationality was a foundation for ancient eudaimonism as it is for us. So ancient Greek eudaimonists accepted the basic tenets of the folk theory, that people are self-interested, although not necessarily narrowly egoistic in their self-interest. Rationality requires orderly ranked preferences and coherent beliefs, including estimates of likelihood and predictions of others' behavior. 
Social organization must address the challenge of rational non-cooperation. States can be rational if they have rational leaders or if institutions and norms that incentivize through praise and blame and punishment cooperation and non-cooperative behavior. So um, incentivize with praise cooperation and with blame and punishment non-cooperation. And finally, that rationality is limited, especially in the practical realm of interstate relations. So they knew all of that, and they're building that into the foundation of eudaimonism. You don't get to build anything like uh, a coherent story about how to live the best possible life without understanding that, at least so I would argue. And therefore, for good or ill, instrumental rationality was built into the very foundations of Greek ethical thought and built into the very foundations of our own Western civilization. So finally, I hope to have convinced you that by revisiting the various ways in which the Greeks thought about and wrote about and acted on the basis of practical reason, we gain a fresh sense of the richness of classical culture. This isn't stripping away anything from classical culture. It's meant to reveal some new aspects, some new facets of it. We recognize anew the extraordinary if problematic legacy we've inherited from antiquity. And I hope we can appreciate anew the depth and breadth of classical scholarship and also how much is left for us still to do. And I hope that, therefore, we might be better equipped ourselves to confront, to understand, to address the manifold challenges of modernity in some Classics indeed can be, I think, must be relevant to what we care about and how we act today. That's it. Thank you very much.